All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan, and welcome to Poetry in the Park. Today's reading will be William Johnson Corey's Minermis in Church. So, uh, William Johnson Corey was a Victorian schoolmaster at Eton College. I guess that would make him a college master. The reason his name Johnson is in parentheses is apparently uh, from what I read in Wikipedia is that he had sort of a interesting relationship with one or more of his students and he had to change his name. But don't hold that against him because he wrote a very beautiful poem. I'm going to read it to you. Minermis in Church. Here we go. You promise heavens free from strife, pure truth and perfect change of will. But sweet, sweet is this human life, so sweet I fain would breathe it still. Your chilly stars I can't forego, this warm kind world is all I know. You say there is no substance here, one great reality above. Back from that void I shrink in fear, and childlike hide myself in love. Show me what angels feel. Till then, I cling a mere weak man to men. You bid me lift my mean desires from faltering lips and fitful veins to sexless souls' ideal choirs, unwearied voices, wordless strains. My mind with fonder welcome owns one dear dead friend's remembered tones. Forsooth the present we must give to that which cannot pass away all beauteous things for which we live by laws of time and space decay. But oh, the very reason why I clasp them is because they die. All right, so that was Minermis in Church by William Johnson Corey. And as you can tell, this is a very old book and the pages are just falling out. It's, uh, it wasn't a very long poem. Those are the words there. And so I just want to talk really quickly what it means to me. Um, so Minermis apparently was some ancient Greek figure. I apologize for not exactly knowing who he was. So imagine this ancient Greek in a Victorian church. And what is he thinking? He's asking, you promise heavens free from strife. What is the promise that we get in church? We are promised an afterlife where there is no strife. There is pure truth, so no lying, no shenanigans, a perfect change of will. So we literally will have no free will, to be honest, right? Because we won't be able to uh, do anything other than good. Um, and so this is the promise, this beautiful place. Nothing's wrong with it. There's no lying. You can't do anything bad. But on the contrary, uh, Minermis sort of prefers the earth. He's like, hey, this human life, yeah, it's got strife. Yeah, you know, people lie. It's not always true all the time. But you know what? It's sweet. And he would rather breathe this human life than the chilly stars uh, because the world down here is warm. You say there is no substance here. So there's sort of this idea in religion, definitely the Christian religion, probably many others as well, that this world, this existence, this reality is not real, that there is no substance actually, and that the great reality is above. I think this probably goes back to Plato and his forms, and perhaps the idea is even older, that this earth is not real, that we should set our hopes, set our desires on some supernatural, transcendent reality that is not here. Um, however, this poem is to fight against that. This poem is to show, well, that sounds okay, but it actually sounds kind of cold. This perfect, uh, what does he say? Uh, he calls it a void. Surprise! I'm not at the park anymore. I apologize. I lost my train of thought once I mentioned the word void. I don't know, it's something about that word. It just sort of sucked me up. And then when I got back to my senses, there was just an obscene amount of noise in the park. There was a cholo uh, just yelling at his dog over and over again. There were birds making incredible amounts of noises, planes passing overhead. So. 
Anyways, I'm back in my house. I'm gonna finish uh, talking about the last few stanzas. Mimnermis says, back from that void, that void of this pure, unadulterated, purely good, perfect, uh, transcendent, after death reality, back from that he shrinks. He's not interested in that. He's more interested in the real, true love, the true warm love that exists here on this earth. And he says, childlike, he wants to hide himself in love. And there's this idea, I don't know if you've ever come across this, that uh, some people ask, why do we have this existence? Why is it here? Why is there so much evil? Why is there love? Why is there so much good? And uh, the idea is for love, for love. Anyways, that's a little another topic for another day but then he goes on and says show me what angels feel till then i cling a mere weak man to men so what do angels feel like what is their feeling inside of them because if i'm going to become like an angel and just live in this cloudy pure realm I want to know what it feels like, because if I don't know, then I'd rather just be a weak man who's going to die and be with my other men, you know, because I'm a man, I'm a human. And so I have human emotions. I have human feelings. I don't know what angels feel. Do they even have feelings? Do they know what passion is? Or are they just sort of this uh, automatons who just follow the will of God unerringly? I don't know. Uh, and I'm not a theologian. And I'm not trying to say that that's how they are. I'm just trying to give my interpretation of what uh, Mimnermanus in church might have been thinking about. Um, and then he goes on. You bid me lift my mean desires from faltering lips and fitful veins to sexless souls, ideal choirs, unwearied voices, wordless strains. So now he's comparing what it's like being a human to being an angel. So the pastor in your church, or uh, let's just say the the mainstream church tradition, which is to for you to transcend your naturalness, for you to transcend your bodily desires, your mean desires. Mean doesn't mean like mean cruel. It just means sort of base, your base human emotions like hunger and thirst. You want to drink a beer. You want to have sex with a woman. You want to be alive. Uh, so the preacher's trying to stop you from that. Church is trying to stop you from that. Doesn't that's it's almost saying that that's not the right way. From faltering lips and fitful veins, right? We have faltering lips. Sometimes we say things we didn't mean to say. Fitful veins. We have passions that course through our body. And if you want me to give this up, what am I going to get? To sexless souls, ideal choirs. So he's imagining angels or the people in heaven are sexless. They're not having sex, right? The church has always been, and today's modern church is probably very different from the Victorian church, but overall, in the past 2,000 years of Christianity, the church is sort of, um, and probably even from the get-go, has been distanced itself from sex. It almost looks at, it used to look at sex as merely um, your duty that must be done, not something to to properly be enjoyed. And if you ever go back in history and read a lot of the patricians, the church fathers, and how they talked about sex, it was literally uh, not a lot of pleasure. In fact, I think they they uh, would have preferred it to have no pleasure. And so Minermus in church, it, Mimnermus, keep mispronouncing his name, I apologize, it's a little bit of a difficult name. Mimnermus, he doesn't want to give up his sex to sing in an ideal choir and just sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, for eternity without sex, just more hallelujahs, but no sex. doesn't sound that great. Uh, so my mind with fonder welcome owns one dear friend's remember tones. So rather than hear these perfect choirs, I'd rather hear my the voice of my old friend. You know, it's, it's warmer. It's more intimate. And last stanza. Forsooth the present we must give to that which cannot pass away, all beauteous things for which we live by laws of time and space decay. But oh, the very reason why I clasp them is because they die. So he sort of reluctantly says, I guess we have to give up this present to, to the eternal. 
um, because everything that is beautiful, everything, the flowers, my hair, uh, the love of that you have with your family, everything, all of the beautiful things, even the mountains, everything from the laws of time and space, they will decay. Everything is falling apart. That is a fundamental part of our existence, but yet things are building up again. So we live in this reality of flux and of change. Um, and he says that's one of the reasons he clasps them. It's because they die. So it's because we die that things are sweet, right? And so you, you, you cherish the things that are temporary. And that's one of the beautiful parts of this life is that it is here for right now. And so the fleetingness, the temporariness is, is the reason that we embrace it with our whole heart. Right. If it was something that was never going to go away, then it would, ch and, it, and it was just always around you, uh, then you, you wouldn't even cherish it. You wouldn't cherish your strength. You wouldn't cherish your health. You wouldn't cherish your family. So this is um, this is a amazing short but very deep poem from the Victorian college master who had an affair with one of his students, William Johnson Corey. And maybe he was writing about how heaven wasn't going to be so cool because he was worried about the afterlife. No, I'm just joking. I don't think it's an impardonable sin to, uh, to, to, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to go there. Anyways, we'll leave it at that. It was a beautiful poem. I, I hope that my interpretation helps anyone out there who has, uh, thought about these topics. Um, I'm not uh, properly trained in theology, but I do have a brain and a heart and a soul. And uh, reading poetry is something that invigorates my heart, invigorates my soul. I can literally be just sort of uh, like a zombie. I read a poem and then it comes alive inside of me. I highly recommend reading poetry. Read it out loud, read it with passion. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching my channel. Click subscribe or like if you liked it. And if not, that's cool. I will see you next time.